Hi there. Welcome back to yet another episode of EMI, EMI being economy, markets, and investment. Let's jump right in. In this episode of EMI, we will be touching upon four key topics that have really been very important for markets and uh, topics that the markets have really reacted on. First would be um, on the US recession. Are we really um, seeing a US recession ahead? Second, uh, whether the Fed will actually cut rates in September 2024, and does it really make sense for the Fed to cut? Third, uh, what is the sensitivity between Nikkei, the Japanese equity index, and the yen? And fourthly, about uh, the yen carry trade. So we'll be talking about these four topics in this month's EMI, EMI for the month of August. Now well, let's start off with a slide on the US. Now there's been a lot of noise about a US recession uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, uh, before that, you didn't really hear too much about uh, too much noise about US recession, but suddenly after the non-farm payroll numbers uh, for the month of July came out, uh, you started hearing a lot of noise around the US recession. Now, where is this coming from? So your non-farm payroll numbers that came out first week of this month of August, which uh, pertains to the month of July, uh, came in much lower than what the markets were expecting. So with a sudden drop in your non-farm payroll number additions, which is basically your job additions in the US, the market started getting concerned saying, is there really going to be a recession in the US? Where is that coming from? It's coming from the fact that unemployment went up a bit in the uh, month of July. Now, before um, uh, concluding that a recession is coming in the US, you have to look at key indicators in the US and try and see how they behaved before in the previous US recession. So the last US recession that we actually saw uh, for all practical purposes was the 2008-2009 recession, the financial, the global financial crisis that happened. Now, there are three key variables you have to look at. One is we're talking about the unemployment rate, which is uh, what the markets reacted to. Then we'll talk about initial jobless claims and we'll talk about the GDP numbers. Now, if you're looking at the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate has moved up, as you can see in this chart here, but has remained under 4% for a while now and it is just normalizing to a higher level. When compared to 2007 to 2009 recession, where you can see that the unemployment rate has been elevated above 5% for a fair bit of time. So currently unemployment rate is well below what we saw in the previous recession and that does not really seem to um, uh, indicate any sign of concern. Now, the second is initial jobless claims. Now, what are jobless claims? So initial jobless claims are fresh uh, claims of joblessness in the US economy. If you look at where they were in the previous recession, you can see that the jobless claim numbers are north of somewhere around 330,000 a month, uh, sorry, uh, a week. If you compare it to now, uh, the jobless claim numbers on a weekly basis are more just above the 210,000 uh, mark or so. So you can see there's a fair bit of difference. So initial jobless claims are much lower than where they were in the previous recession. Now we'll come to the third and the most important part. Uh, where is US GDP growth, US growth? US growth has been trending up over the last few quarters and they are much higher than where they were in the previous recession. Now, one small bit that I forgot to mention is how do you read these charts? R minus one is one month before a US recession. Um, we are talking about the recession in 2007 to 2009. R minus four is four months before a recession. R minus seven is seven months before a recession. Similarly, these weekly initial jobless claims, R minus one is one week before, four weeks before, seven weeks before. And similarly, you read this as one quarter before, two quarters before, four quarters before, five quarters before. So like you can see, like you can see, all the three key indicators we are looking at that talk about a, a, a probability of US recession, all of them are well below where they were in the previous 2008-2009 uh, recession. So none of these indicators are, indi are telling us that a US recession is down the line. Now we. Also remember here that 
all through 2022 and 2023 and in our dailies, we have been consistently talking about how the U.S. is not going into a recession. A slowdown in the recession is quite likely that we will see in the quarters ahead. But a recession or a hard landing, as the markets call it, we don't really see that at all. Now, we let's come to the second aspect of it. Um, are there some very key banking-related indicators that are telling us of a recession? How did these indicators behave during previous recessions and how are they now? This will also give us a sense on uh, the narratives that you hear in the market about how the financial conditions are very tight and how banking standards probably are tight. Let's take a look at this chart here. So there are two things this chart tells us. One, uh, this chart is basically a, a pictorial depiction of a survey the Federal Reserve conducts on a regular basis. It's called the SLOOS, which is the Fed's Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey. It's a survey of eight large U.S. domestic banks and around 24 U.S. Uh, branches and agencies of foreign banks. Now, the last, uh, which was, I think, the end of uh, July, when this survey came out, an updated version of this survey came out, it was telling us that as the net percentage of U.S. banks, of domestic banks, net percentage of U.S. domestic banks were actually seeing tightening standards for commercial and industrial loans to large and mid-market firms. So to simplify it, let's just say uh, the number of domestic banks that were seeing tightening lending standards were coming down. And the uh, demand for loans from large and middle market firms that was going up. Now, this is a classic indication of economic activity being normal. It is not an indication of a pre-recession economic activity uh, phase. So if you look at the last two crises, if you look at the crisis, the period uh, just before the 08-09 crisis and the period uh, before the uh, early 2000 crisis, you can see that tightening standards are going up and you can see that the demand for loans are going down. Again, the same thing happens here. Tightening standards are going up and your demand for loans are coming down. Here you're seeing the exact opposite. Tightening standards are going down and demand for loans are going up. Now, when you say tightening stands are going, standards are going down, it means that the banks are not reluctant to give more and more loans to middle and uh, uh, large companies. Tightening standards going up, meaning that banks are increasingly reluctant to lend to a large and mid-market firms. So this is also telling us that we're not anywhere close to a recession. And one more thing this is telling us is that this entire market narrative that you're hearing of September rate cuts or very early rate cuts and louder noises around rate cuts that the markets are pricing in, it seems unlikely that a, sep uh, that a September um, a Federal Reserve rate cut start will happen. Now, uh, this is something that we have been uh, talking about in most of our uh, uh, views, central banks, for central banks, inflation is important, but more important is overall growth. Unless you see an appreciable drop in uh, growth, central banks will not really start cutting rates just because inflation is going down. And if you look at where in the US is now on macro parameters and growth parameters, you're seeing the US at um, are doing fairly well, a fair bit of resilience. And more importantly, if you look at the uh, June quarter GDP numbers that we saw in the US, you saw additional strength much stronger than what the markets were expecting, largely from the consumption basket. Now let's come to the relationship between the Japanese equity market, Nikkei, and the yen. Now before we talk about the Nikkei, we really need to understand what drives the yen. A very simple way of looking at the currency depreciation or appreciation, here we're talking about the yen, is difference between interest rates between the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Japan. Now, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Japan, Federal Reserve's interest rates are currently somewhere close to 5.5%, and the Bank of Japan's interest rate is at 0 0.25, which means it's a fair bit of gap between the Federal Reserve's interest rate and the Bank of Japan's interest rate. Wider this interest rate, 
weaker will be the currency and smaller this uh, this difference uh, in the interest rates uh, stronger will be the currency what we have seen over the last decade or so is you have actually seen the difference between the federal reserve's interest rate and the bank of japan's interest rate widen which has structurally given a, a a directional weakness to for the yen so as the yen continues to weaken the nikkei continues to go higher and higher now what is the relationship there because a very large chunk of the nikkei index the weights of the index are assigned to japanese export oriented companies that always benefit when the currency weakens now if you look at the slide here three very key sectors that have very large weights in the nikkei are automotive electronics and machinery so over the last 10 plus years as the yen continued to depreciate you started seeing a fair bit of uh, strength in the nikkei driven by largely these sectors first peak of august for um, uh, the reasons that we spoke about earlier your non farm payroll numbers in the us started coming off and just before that the bank of japan raised interest rates one more time the first time it raised interest rates was in march of this year and then it raised interest rates uh, in the last week of july after that you have started seeing an appreciation in the yen we spoke about remember we said the the minute the gap between the uh, uh, the federal reserve's interest rates and the bank of japan interest rate starts coming down the currency gets stronger and as a result of that you started seeing uh, an appreciation in the yen and the carry trade that we talk about that started unwinding we'll talk about the carry trade in a bit this differential between the federal reserve's interest rates and the bank of japan's interest rates from a market point of view can actually be seen in this chart here as and when you see the yield differential increase you see the yen weaken the yield differential comes down the yen strengthens yield differential starts going up again yen starts weakening again and like we talked about these sectors here automotive electronics and machinery you can see that um, this the directionality over the last 10 years plus when you saw a very sharp increase or depreciation in the yen the nikkei moves almost hand in hand largely because a uh, um, uh, weaker yeah yen means a stronger uh, nikkei because the heavy weights in the nikkei are largely these three sectors now let's come to what happened uh, in the first week of august you started seeing a sharp drop in the dollar and you started seeing the yen appreciate because the bank of japan raised rates already two times in the past uh, one in march and one the last week of uh, july as a result of that market started expecting one a recession in the us which means they started expecting that the dollar would start getting uh, weaker and weaker and second they felt that the bank of japan would continue aggressively raising rates which meant that they started expecting the yen to start entering a phase of sharp appreciation a sharp appreciation in the uh, uh, in the yen would mean what would mean that the nikkei could start reversing because of yen strength now this is largely the relationship between the yen and the nikkei now let's come to the most important part about the yen carry trade now in the earlier slides we spoke about we said see the differential between the us interest rate and the bank of japan's interest rate determines how strong or how weak the yen would be if you can uh, see the overlay in on this chart the light gray bars are the yen you can see that as the gap between the federal reserve's interest rate and the bank of japan narrows the yen sees an appreciation and post that as the gap starts widening the yen starts depreciating now it is very important to understand what a carry trade is carry trade in very simple terms is uh, somebody let's say x buying cheap and investing that money in higher yields abroad 
the most important aspect here is that the currency should not move in an unfavorable direction. So if you look at this small para here, the trade, this carry trade will go on till the exchange rate of the country you invest in. Say, for example, you're investing in the US by borrowing from Japan, the uh, US dollar should remain stronger. The minute the US dollar starts weakening, this entire trade might not really be very profitable. You can take a look at this example here. So X borrows um, um, 78,000 yen, um, uh, which is roughly around $1,000 equivalent in 2012 for 0% interest rate. And let's say the exchange rate then was around 78 uh, uh, yen to the dollar. Now X invests this in US treasuries at 1.5%. Now, if he holds on to this uh, trade for le let's say around 12 years, and currently the yen dollar exchange rate is 147. Uh, if she repays this now, closes the trade, instead of repaying $1,000 equivalent, she will only be repaying around $478 equivalent, which means that 75% of the profit that you have made in this carry trade comes largely only from foreign exchange. So when the market started expecting that the currency would start uh, uh, witnessing a sharp appreciation spell, naturally it started getting a little worried and it said uh, maybe we will have to start unwinding our carry trades because if it comes closer to the exchange rate at which we started, then um, uh, for all uh, possibility, the carry trades will start making losses. Now, this is the most important. And therefore, when carry trades unwind, because these carry trades generally are leveraged. For example, if I have 100 rupees, I will leverage that and it will be this leveraged money that will be invested in these carry trades, which means when these carry trades unwind, uh, they tend to distort markets because there's a significant amount of carry trades that are getting unwound because a lot of leveraged money is getting unwound. Now, this is largely what you really need to know about the carry trade. We then talk about uh, four key macro indicators in India. We saw uh, CPI inflation in India come down quite sharply, but it is important to note here that this sharp drop in CPI inflation is mainly because of base effects. Now, what is a base effect? Same period last year, vegetable prices had gone up very sharply. So on a year-on-year -year basis, you actually start, uh, saw inflation come off. But this is a very optical uh, move. For the month of uh, uh, August as well, you would see the base effect playing out. But after that, uh, the base effects would sort, sort of start now normalizing. More important part to look out here is that you saw uh, core inflation inch up a bit. On the whole, India inflation doesn't really seem concerning. Your manufacturing and services PMI numbers, though they moderated a bit in the month of July, they're still holding up well above the uh, 50 mark. Now, what is the importance of this 50 mark? Anything above 50 is expansion and anything below 50 is contraction. So we have been above 50 for more than nearly two years now. e -able numbers are much higher than what they were in all the pre last three uh, financial years. So have been GST collection. So domestic macro, like the governor also put it, uh, has been fairly resilient. Now, we touch upon uh, what uh, the market insights we put out on the second of uh, this month, where we spoke about why did US markets, especially small caps, go up so sharply in the month of July. If you see here, uh, in the month of July, US small cap went up 10%, mid cap went up 5%, and large cap went up only 1%. Now, the reason was largely because in the run-up to really mid of July, you started seeing a lot of commentary from the Federal Reserve members and Powell about how interest rates could start coming down in the months ahead. And immediately the market said, okay, maybe it's going to be September. September, the Federal Reserve is going to start cutting rates. And as a result, small caps started going up. 
Now, what does small cap have to do with the Federal Reserve commentary or Federal Reserve's interest rates? If you look at this chart here, you can see that small caps are very sensitive to yield movements. The 10-year yield in the US directly responds to uh, 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 expectation around Federal Reserve rates. So when you're so you read this uh, on an inverse basis. So if the orange line actually moves up, it means yields are moving down. And if the orange line is moving down, it means yields are moving up. So whenever you see yields moving up, you can see equity markets coming down. And when you see yields moving uh, uh, lower, you can see equity markets moving higher. And in all these phases, you see small cap tends to slightly outperform the mid and, uh, mid and large caps. The same thing happened around April or so. From April onwards, uh, you can see that there has been a fair bit of underperformance of small caps compared to mid and large caps. But around um, the time when markets started expecting a sharp uh, change or a sharp pivot from the Fed on rates, you started seeing small caps rally quite hard in line with yields moving much lower. Now, the main reason is that small caps tend to be heavy on borrowing uh, because they have to fund their operations. And this makes small caps very sensitive to interest rates. And therefore, whenever you see an appreciable drop in yields, it generally tends to uh, lead to a short outperformance in small caps as long as the uh, yield appreciation continues. In other slides in our EMI, we talk about how South Africa topped emerging markets while Japan led developed markets on one month returns. Uh, in India, IT, Pharma and FMCG were the top sectors in July. Uh, if you're looking at earnings growth and expectations for 2024, this is an interesting table where it tells us that on a 2024 earnings growth basis, India tops all its global peers on growth expectations. And to an extent, it justifies the elevated PE that is attributed to India. On valuations, we continue to see mid-cap uh, uh, PE one year forward move up. Your small cap uh, appeared to inch up slightly above large cap valuations in the month of July. Now we'll come to the segment that we spoke about, we introduced last uh, month. What must you know before investing? We talk about two concepts here. The first concept is about why time horizon is the most important to stabilize one's equity returns. In the uh, last EMI, we talked in detail about how time horizon is the most important and how you can reduce your possibility of losses by holding on to your investment for a long, longer time frame. And we talked about how six years and seven years are optimal time frames where you can actually increase your probability of touching your 12% CAGR on your large cap returns. In this chart here, you can see your one year CAGR in markets are so volatile. The longer you stay invested in the market, your equity returns start getting stabilized over a period of time. So your one-year CAGR and your 20-year CAGR, you see the difference. You can see how stable, almost like a straight line, your 20-year CAGR is. It gives you more certainty and predictability on your investment returns. Now, whenever we speak about returns, whenever we speak about markets going up, the uh, counter is also true. The markets also have to correct. The markets also have to consolidate. We take a look here about uh, on uh, your large cap, mid cap, and small cap, how have these markets corrected over a period of time? So we use a measure of drawdown. So drawdown basically measures how the index uh, behaves from its all-time high. How much does this index move down from its all-time high? And it sort of helps us measure downside volatility. So one, I think it's fair to expect that large cap will have less volatility compared to mid cap, which will have less volatility compared to a small cap. And that is exactly what you see here. We've taken data from January of 2004, so we can compare large, mid, and small around the same time frames. So large cap volatility 
uh, your drawdowns, long-term average is around 9%, uh, mid-cap is around 14%, and your small cap is around 24%. These are your dr average drawdowns from their all-time highs. Now, it tells us two more things. It When we look at drawdowns, how long does large cap spend at more than 10% drawdowns? How long does mid cap spend at uh, more than 20% drawdowns? And how long does small cap spend uh, uh, in more than 30% drawdowns? So you can see these three numbers here. 34% of the time, large cap spends uh, in a more than 10% drawdown phase. 30% of the time, mid cap spends uh, uh, in a greater than 20% drawdown phase and small caps 40% of the time spends in a greater than 30% drawdown phase, which is why as you go down the cap curve, the time frame you will need to give for your investment also increases. Though the chart on this right here is basically a breakdown of the pre of this chart here where uh, we break this more than 10% into smaller um, uh, buckets, more than 20% into smaller buckets and more than 30% we keep it as is. So the short story here is markets do see drawdowns. If you look at drawdowns over the last few years, we've not really seen very sharp drawdowns in the market. We have not seen uh, a, a sustained phase of market correction in the uh, recent past. If you look at history, history tells us that nearly one third of the time, large caps spend in drawdowns of more than 10%. Uh, mid caps spend roughly less than one third in drawdowns of more than 20%. And small caps, 40% of their time, they spend uh, in drawdowns of more than 30%. The importance of long-term returns in the equity markets comes very clear in this table here. Now, we calculated this on USD returns, not on local returns. If you look at uh, local currency returns, it will be much higher. If you look at US dollar returns, India still, on a 20-year basis, India uh, clocks at 12.2% CAGR you know, on a dollar basis. On one, three, and five-year, India beats both emerging market and developed market peers. On a 10-year and 15-year basis, there has been a, a relatively a muted performance compared to the United States, but we are the second uh, largest uh, on returns on a 10-year and 15-year basis. But on a 20-year long-term CAGR, we defeat, uh, we beat the United States on 20-year CAGR returns by more than nearly uh, 2 to 2.5% or so. And lastly, uh, the month of August started with a lot of panic, with a lot of fear. It is extremely important, like uh, uh, the veteran investor Warren Buffet said, it is extremely important to understand what your fear is and uh, make use of these opportunities in the market. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.